REM is one of my favorite bands, right? They're on the list, top 20. And Losing My Religion is one of my favorite songs. Actually has a pretty darn good video too, if you remember videos. So religion, it is one of the topics that we just don't talk about, right? We don't talk about religion. We don't want to talk about sex. We don't want to talk about politics. We don't want to talk about racism. We don't want to talk about money. Did I cover it all? Did I get all the taboos? I think I got all the taboos. I think I did. But religion has such a huge part in our society. And it can play a huge part in our life as well. Now, I'm not so sure, but I could have sworn, I told you guys, because I think I did, I think I told you, that I have always been the kid who likes to kick up dust. I was always that kid who was going to ask why and going to dig deeper. And I have a thing for pushing the boundaries just a little bit, just a smidge. I don't want to tip anybody over, but I'm going to push it. And so we're going to talk about religion. Hello and welcome to Ladies Listen Up. I am your host, Gwendolyn G.R. Houston Jack. And religion, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Religion is one of the factors that allows us to quickly determine if we want to get to know someone or not. Like a good chunk of people that we tend to meet as kids, when we're young, if they're not our cousins or some other extended family, they're at church. People we know at church, church and school, but primarily church. You kind of grow up with those people because it's where you congregate on a specific day until, I don't know, you're a teenager, sometimes an adult, but it's where you start. So religion has a huge impact on the world we live in. And if you've taken into account all that is happening right here, right now in the U.S., then you know religion has to be talked about. I mean, I don't care how people are like, well, you know, you really shouldn't talk about it. We really shouldn't go there. Gwendolyn is going there. Happily, I'm skipping through the woods, skipping. And I'm going there. Let me start with my history first. So my mother is a retired minister. Retired minister. And before she became a minister, we we went to church very often, quite often. If I'm not mistaken, I know there was Sunday. um, There was the kids Bible study. There was women's Bible study. We didn't do we didn't do choir when we were at this first church. I only remember three. Only remember three. Um, and they're just they're not fragments, but there are very specific memories that pop up because they always impact some part of life, you know. But we were avid churchgoers. Now my dad. When they would do the directory, um, my dad is in a couple of those photos. He was attending church with us when it was just the two girls. Now, when my brothers came along, I don't remember seeing him in some of the pictures. And it's just interesting, depending on the family dynamics, you will typically see the mother in church. The father kind of comes and goes, depending. It's not, um, it's not always as consistent. but. He was in he was in some of the 
directories of the families and everything. And, you know, we were, we attended, as I said, at least three churches that I can remember. The first two, it just felt like status quo. You get up early on Sunday, you're going to go to Bible school, you may go to Bible study. Then you come out, you do your part and you know all your Bible verses and you learn your songs and things of that nature. And I remember getting dressed like my mother would sew our clothes and we would have a dress that was very similar to what she was wearing in terms of pattern and style. You know, we had our little frilly socks and the patent leather shoes that would squeak when you put them side by side. So there are some pretty good memories. There's some pretty good memories in there. But somewhere along the line, nine years old, maybe 10, maybe 10, 10, 11. You know how you start coming of age, as you like to say, when you're a kid about to be a preteen and you're like coming of age. You start questioning some of the things. And it's not a matter of like, you didn't want to go. Like we were raised Christian, you know, we celebrated Easter and uh, we did Christmas and things of that nature. But something, something in my head was like, I don't know. Like it just, it didn't always make sense to me, right? It just didn't always make sense. So I just remember when we left the first church and went to this other, it was a young preacher. I want to say he was just getting his congregation started. And so we didn't have an actual building. They were using a, um, using a school, school cafeteria and the school rooms to do the kids Bible study. And then to have like the overall sermon. And it felt pretty good. Met some really cool people, met some really cool friends. Again, the people you meet when you're in church as a kid, you tend to stick with them because you guys are all growing together. Like you all stick together. And then something shifted. It's like something changed. So we're talking early 90s. Something, something shifted. It just didn't feel the same. Now, I know you all know about the building fund. Please don't act like you don't know. Don't act like you don't know what the building fund is. The building fund where people put in their offerings or their tithes so they can pay for a new church home that eventually is built. Eventually. I don't know how long it takes. I I don't. I've seen some new buildings go up. I don't know how long they've been saving for that church. I really don't know. I didn't bother to ask. But I remember that there was a shift in my perception of this situation, right? From from where I'm coming from as a kid, I felt a shift. And there was more emphasis on the income of the family, like what the family income was. There was an emphasis on that. There was an emphasis on the jobs that the families had and they started keeping tabs of who donated what. And like I said, it's, some things get fuzzy because you know how they had like the program and I didn't save those programs, but they had, they, they had like a little ledger, if you will, it just kind of said who donated what and they would call out certain families and things like that. So you just, Yeah, but I can't get past how the church shifted, how the congregation shifted, and it just felt a little different. Now, my mother has always had Bible study at our house. Like I said, it was kid Bible study, it was women Bible study, there there was some Bible study, and we were studying some Bibles. We were studying, and. Although I'm not exactly sure what happens. So again, I am a child. Just, I'm on the sidelines. But I can't help but recall there was a kerfuffle about my mother hosting the women's Bible study at her home. 
and I didn't, I didn't understand it. I didn't get it. There was also a kerfuffle about my mother even preaching because she's a woman. And according to the men of that church, women weren't called to teach. Now, depending on where you stand with that, there are some people who don't believe it, that women have the, um, I don't know, blessing to teach. Well, I'm a woman. And just because you're a woman doesn't mean that you do or don't agree with that. I don't, I don't agree with it. I think if the good Lord has touched you and you are given the gift to spread the word, then you go and spread it. I don't really care what you look like. That's not, but that's, that's when it started for me. When I started noticing some of these differences and shifts and just the way that we used to operate, it just felt funny for me. And it wasn't too much longer after that, that we left that church. Mother did get ordained. She was ordained because she's always been teaching and, and what have you. And I remember her studying um, Judaism as well and uh, looking to learn Hebrew and just watching her journey as a child, you do, you are influenced by what your parents do. Now we could have easily taken my dad's route and just watched football on Sunday. Could have been the case. But I got I got really interested in religion. So much so that when I attended college at FIT, no doubt, right? Here we are at the Fashion Institute. I took courses on, on religion and breaking down the history of these multiple religions that we have today. So I guess I was 14, 15. We got to a place where we were given the option to attend church or not. And there were sometimes we were just like, yeah, we're not going. It just felt different, right? It just didn't feel the same. This is also the same amount of time, again, the 90s, when all, all of hell broke loose in the church. And for me, for me, it shook me. It shook me. And at this point, this is when I start to lose my religion. <laughs> the 90s. Hmm. You know, let me tell you about, about when I think about religion in this country, and I'm looking at what I studied in college and then just all that we have seen. Mind you, the events that happened that caused me to stop and pause happened before I got to FIT, which of course influenced my, oh, I want to dig deeper into that topic. There were so many preachers that were falling from grace. Now, I am still approaching all of this as a child, right? I'm a teenager. But when you look at things and you recall the stories you have been told in Bible school, if you will, you start asking yourself, some of this math, it ain't mathin'. It's not that up for me. So you have Jimmy Swagger, him and his infamous, I have seen. You have the, the bakers, Jimmy and Tammy Faye. You have a lot of evangelists on TV that had gotten up for years talking to people who all of a sudden their dirty laundry was being aired. And so depending on where you are with your faith, you get a little shook. Now me as a kid, 
I started saying to myself, something doesn't make sense to me, right? I'm watching this one church sort of shift in how it operates. I'm watching these TV evangelists come clean about their prostitutes and money and all this other foolishness. It just, all of it just felt like, what's wrong here? What is wrong with this, dare I say, organized religion? It's the same thought I get when I go to the grocery store. So if I go one of two ways, if I go to the grocery store and we're talking like a quarter mile, a quarter mile, I'm going to pass one, two, three, four, five, five churches, five churches. And I kept saying to myself, we're all, we're all honoring the same God. Yes. And some of these churches are right across the street from each other. But one is Pentecostal and one is Baptist and one is, I'm thinking, but what, what, wait, what? Now, like I said, I studied in college. I get how someone didn't like how somebody was running the ship, wanted to be their own captain, took a group of people, went off and did their own thing and made their own rules. And this is the point where Gwendolyn said, if man wasn't involved, Maybe. <laughs> now, the one thing my mother has always said to us when it comes to religion is that you must read the Bible for yourself, right? That was always her deal. It was never a let someone tell you and just follow blindly. It was check it, check it for yourself. Check it and question it even. And when I look at how religion has touched some lives in a negative sense, which we won't cover today, it's like a drug. And depending on who is at the helm of the ship, they use that power and they use that drug to their own advantages, right? I mean, look at Jim Jones. So much so that when people finally woke up, he wouldn't even let them leave. They weren't even allowed to leave. Right? So we know that religion can fill some, some gaps and some holes. It does give us comfort, right? If you believe in a higher power, I believe in God, whoever you, you serve, you got your beliefs, but it gives, it brings you comfort. And depending again on who's flying this plane, sometimes you can find yourself falling more for the person than the actual word. Those are two separate things. When I hear people brag, and I'm going to use the word brag. Um, when they brag about their pastor, my pastor does this, my pastor does that, my pastor has this, pastor did blah, blah. It, it gives me great pause. When people say, you should come to my church and you should do it, I'm like, mm, 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 mm. I will tell you. I know that church can be had wherever you are right? Because it's in here. The physical building is just that. It's a building. The building can be burned down. The church is not gone. Still there's the people, the congregation. It's each individual person. To me, visiting a building doesn't necessarily speak to me. Now, let me just, let me just go back a step because when we talk about that shift that I noticed as a teenager, I want to say it is in full throttle now. When I hear about these prosperity preachers who have the audacity to say that the Lord is blessing you, you'll have riches and yada, yada, yada. If you don't have that, then you probably did something wrong. Yeah, 
I have to have to catch my tongue. That prosperity preaching where people are giving their last dollar to someone so that they can drive around in some fancy car and wear some jewelry and whatever else. And I have nothing against things. Hear me clearly. Nothing against things. However, I remember reading about a church that took up offerings. They had like a bingo, kind of like a little lottery, like a lottery. And they would pick someone's name and they would take that money to help them get out of debt. It went back into the community. I don't know where that time has gone. Now, I'm sure you're saying, well, Gwendolyn, you're not part of any church. I am not part of any church. I have strong issues with joining any organized something. Just going to put it out there. Like, it's just, that does not work for me. When I look at where the church is now, beyond the prosperity preaching. And this goes against, it goes across all of them, right? Catholics and all. When you look at the number of children that have been abused in the church, that abuse of power and how it has impacted the lives of many, many people. Now, I am not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not saying that. But I also can't help but notice how we, as a society, like to turn a blind eye to some of this. Like just recently, there was a preacher here in Texas assaulted, sexually assaulted a young lady. And the uh, DA couldn't deal with him that he would not have to be um, registered as a sexual offender. And I want to say he was given probation. So he is more than likely going to do it again to somebody else's child. It's that sort of, not even sort of, it is the clear disregard for the safety of others when there's so much power at play. And I get it. People are like, you know, helping somebody out here and helping somebody out there. And all of a sudden, you know, we want to um, ignore what's going on around us. You know, power is a hell of a drug. It's a hell of a drug. Now, I haven't really had any myself. But when I look at the story and when I review the carnage, I don't know. I don't know how else to respond to that. I'm gonna come back to this because this is not a topic that um, we're not going to revisit. It's so big. It is so big that it just can't be touched in one fell swoop. People will look at you funny depending on how you talk about religion. Now, if you have watched any um, any of my other social media platforms, in the middle of my conversations, I'm putting out Bible scriptures, most definitely. Putting out the Bible scripture. We're going to share some word. Because for me, it's about the spirit. The number of people that I see on TV today who attach themselves to the title of Christianity, but the amount of hate that is spewed from their mouths, I don't understand. I don't understand. I also don't understand the rules that come from organized religion, particularly when it comes to women, okay? No pants, no cards, no playing music, no short hair, it's just, you, you know, some really, I don't even have the right word. I don't have any words to really discuss. And I know I've said it really twice because I'm just like so flabbergasted. I don't have any words to truly articulate what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. I mean, it doesn't escape me that in some of these religions led by men, 
consumed with power that women become like property, clearly second-class citizens, simply there to fulfill someone else's needs and bear some kids. And, you know, that's, that's about it. But somewhere in there, they're going to get their ticket to heaven by doing X, Y, Z. I mean, I just, when I say this is a big, so this is one of those big balls of yarn that are all kind of tangled and it's going to take some time to untangle it. I am not saying that if you belong to a church that you should leave your church. I'm not saying that at all. But I do believe there is a place to ask yourself, is this mine? A lot of us grew up a particular way. We were raised as Christian, my siblings and I, raised as Christians. And some of the things that I did as a kid, I don't do anymore. Like, I don't celebrate Easter. I don't. However, if I am in town, I will do a Passover Seder with my mother. Done that. I don't celebrate Christmas and kind of give gifts all year round. I even say happy holidays. Now, I like some holiday music. And I'll watch the movies, but people are like, you don't have any trees and you don't have any and you don't. No, I don't do any of that. None of it. The things that we did as kids, you have to ask yourself at a certain point, is that your religion? Are those your values or is this what you've always done? Is what you've always known? And so you continue doing it because that's just what you do. See, I question, question a lot of stuff. I'm the why kid. And why am I doing that? And why are we doing this? And why am I doing that? You know how people pick out a Bible verse and will give you literally an hour sermon off of one verse? And I find myself, because every now and then I will visit because I've been invited. I'm like, fine, I will, I will go. But when I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this person preach, give his sermon, and they're talking in circles, I get agitated. Because then I'm thinking, okay, I could have been somewhere. I could have, like, I'm sitting here and he's talking about absolutely nothing. Nothing for me, at least, that would fulfill my soul. And this is why, again, when I meet other people, who have their own stories with religion. They have moved towards a more spiritual mindset. They have let go of some of the rules that just didn't make sense to them. Like you have to question some of this. I really do believe you have to question some of it. Heck, you got to question all of it. Because you're talking about the good Lord making water into wine. And y'all tell me that we can't drink. You know that don't make sense. It don't make sense. Religion's a touchy subject because it, it hits home and it forces us to look at ourselves and really consider what we are a part of. Is it the right thing to be a part of? I don't know. It's the question we have to answer for ourselves, right? Maybe you decide that uh, being a Buddhist is where you want to go. Maybe you decide that you want to convert to Judaism and you've been a Christian all your life. I don't know. Or maybe you decide that I'm just going to believe in a higher power and just be good to people. I don't know. I do know this, though. The stronghold that religion has right now in our country, concerning, very concerning, that you either agree with us or you are against us. You know, when things like that start popping up, my spidey sense kicks in. So I'm going to leave you with this. As you think about your history of religion, and look at your own spirituality. As I always say, give yourself the space and grace to grow and learn.